Um, this is really a continuation of the journey that we're on, or certainly the journey I'm on. And so I just share what God's sharing with me, and you can do it for what you want with it. <laughs> it's your business. But um, I've, I've been on this journey now for some weeks where being a doer of the word is really being highlighted to me from the Holy Spirit. Um, it's so easy to get caught in a in a rut where we just become knowledge bearers, gain knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, mm-hmm. and we don't do anything with the knowledge, and it actually can be harmful to us. Yeah. It can make us proud and boastful and arrogant and, and, and lazy spiritually. So the Holy Spirit's really been working on me, chastising me to be more of a doer of the word and I'm not there yet, I've got to be honest, I'm, I'm on a journey. I'd like to be doing a lot more, um, and I know we don't get to heaven by doing, so please hear what I'm saying. But the doing is a byproduct, or, or, or it's evidence of our faith. That's really what it is. So that's the journey I'm on. And so First Colossians, I'll stand up, chapter, um, chapter 1, verse 9, through to verse 10. For this reason, since the day we heard it, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, I want to highlight that word, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. The desire of every one of us should be to please God. Uh, To the Apostle Paul, that was the reason he lived, to please God. Um, I was chatting to someone in the early hours of the morning this week in Denmark, and they asked me the question, "What what would you say is the purpose of your life? And I said, to please God. Nothing more, nothing less, to please God. That's what drives me. And I've failed so many times in doing that, like all of us. But nevertheless, I pick that up again as my primary goal in life, which is to please the Lord. Jesus said, every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Um, So bearing fruit is not only a good thing, but it's a necessity for each one of us. John 8, verse 29. Jesus, this is the words of Jesus. Listen to this. And he who sent me is with me. Mm -hmm. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. What an amazing statement. I wish I could say that. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. (laughs) I always... Do those things that please him. What an incredible accomplishment that each one of us should strive for. That should be the motivating force of why we wake up every day, why we live. As Jesus came up from being baptized in that Jordan River, the confirmation from his loving Father is heard and saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom... I am well pleased. Each one of us one day will stand before him. I hope for each one of us that's the words that we hear. Mm. Beloved daughter, beloved son, I am well pleased with you. If that's all I ever get for eternity, that's enough. I don't care if I'm living in the backwater shack. I don't care what I'm living in. I don't care about the mansion. All I care is to hear those words. That's what's important to me. That's what drives my life. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he said, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Mm. So there's another confirmation. That should be the reason we live. If anyone ever asks you, 
what are you doing here? What's the purpose of your life? Uh, we talk about a purpose-driven life. That is the only purpose to be driven by. There is nothing else we should be driven by. To be pleasing to our Father in whatever we do. And I'm going to make a distinction between our position in Christ and our practice. And it's through Christ that we're all made righteous. But we can't become righteous. We've been made righteous by the precious blood of Christ. But beyond that, each one of us um, need to live our life out in a way that reflects faith. For without faith, we can't please him. Our life has to be a life of faith, faith, faith. My goodness. So when Paul says we make it our aim to be well pleasing to him, he's saying we make it our aim to live by faith. That's what he's saying. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. <laughs> so we come back to the sin of faith. If we don't live by faith, we don't please him. What is faith? Uh, I've kind of got my simplified version of this, that faith is... Taking the word of God and being a doer. It's just really simple. It's just it's just walking in the word. It's not selecting what we want from it. It's just doing it. Hebrews ten thirty eight says, Now the just shall live by faith. But and we've quoted that so often, but the rest of the verse is just as important. But he who draws back my soul finds no pleasure in him. <laughs> huh? My soul finds no pleasure in him. If we pull back, when God speaks of drawing back, he's not cutting us much slack here. <laughs> he's saying, you either live by faith or yeah. you don't. If yeah. you don't, you don't please me. There's yeah. not really any middle ground mm -hmm. here. There's no slack in this. Mm -hmm. So faith is the only way which God lives. God cannot operate out of the realm of faith. So he requires the same of his children to live by faith. And let's be honest, it's not always easy. Why? Because we've got an enemy. And that enemy wants to set traps, wants to put obstacles in our way, wants to trip us up, wants to tempt us. Every day of our life we're encountering the spiritual battle. Without faith it's impossible to please God. Scriptures we all know. He that comes to God must believe He's a rewarder of those yeah. who diligently seek him. You know, so many have believed God for their salvation. But they find it very difficult to believe God for their daily life. Yeah. This week I sat down and I pondered on that. And I thought, why is it it's so easy to believe for salvation? But it's much harder to live yeah. a life of salvation. Because salvation is not something we get when we get there. Salvation is something we get when we receive Christ into our life. So eternity starts at that point. And uh, as I thought on that, I come to a conclusion. You may think I'm right or wrong. I think the motivation of most of us for eternal life is fear. <laughs> most of us, are, we don't want to go to hell. I mean, it's either, it's either fear or you're stupid. Because, <laughs> because if, if, if you're not afraid of going to hell, there's something wrong with your thinking. <laughs> so I simplified this down to this. The motivation to, 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 for salvation is, is, is like an air ticket. It's our air ticket to eternity, if you like, with Christ. Because everyone's going to live eternally. I do that because I'm afraid. Now, get me, hear me right here, because there's different types of fear. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. So that's the fear I'm referring to here. I am afraid of God. I know what he can do to me if I don't honor him. He can send me to hell. So that fear to me is a very real thing. People say we shouldn't be afraid of God. He's all love. God is all love and he's also fearful. We have this picture, the one-sided picture painted of God. And I know from my own experience of standing in the presence of one of his messengers only once in my life, you don't go and pat 
when a guy's messengers on the back and say, how are you, mate? You fall to your knees in fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's why we accept Jesus Christ <coughs> into our life, because we have a fear of the awesomeness of this God that we serve. How is it we can believe for salvation, but not for our day-to-day -day lives? Because salvation is a daily, eternal journey. You know, for the Israelites, this was the problem. The problem is really more common than what we like to think. Number one, they believed God could save them from Egypt. They believed that. So they initially believe for their salvation. We've all done that. We've all come out of Egypt believing for a salvation. Number two, they believe God at the Red Sea, which is when you get baptized in water and you die to yourself. For some of us, we probably need to get rebaptized. I don't know your lives. Because for some of us, that baptism was not a death to self. It was just a religious exercise. And there needs to be a death to self, a burial and a resurrection. They believed God for that. God parted the Red Sea. They went through the waters of baptism, as it were. And they came up the other side. So their salvation was an action. The salvation coming out of Egypt, getting baptized. But when they come out of that, things went horribly wrong. Not entering the promised land or living in what God had provided was evidence they did not live by faith. They did not live by faith. What did they live by? Unbelief. It was because of their unbelief they didn't enter in. Psalm 78 verse 18 says, shows us how, how, how we can go from faith to unbelief. In verse 18 of Psalm 78, it says, They tested God in their heart by asking for food that they fancied or they desired. In other words, they weren't content. And uh, when I read that psalm, it really pricked me. How often do I complain about certain things in my life instead of thanking God for his provision? Do I complain about the house that he's provided me with, the income, the job, the wife, the children, whatever it may be, my job? Mm. How often do I murmur against those things because what I'm doing is murmuring against him? Instead of seeing that we're on a journey, and sure, the desert experience couldn't have been nice, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. But the point is, it was a part of the process of the journey God was taking them on to mature them, to bring them to a place where he was going to bless them abundantly. And each one of us are on that same journey. And along the way, I wonder if we are a great deal different than the Israelites. They tested God in their heart by asking for something they did not have. They focused on what they didn't have rather than what they did have. What we did this morning here is what God loves. Heaven mm -hmm. rejoices when it hears the testimonies of the saints. Mm -hmm. When we elevate the work of God in our life, not the work of the enemy, when we speak of God's goodness and his provision, heaven rejoices in that. Watch the progress of evil in their lives as they were drawn away, as James says in chapter 1, of their own lusts. Each person is tempted when he is drawn away with his own desire or his own lust, and he's enticed. They were drawn away. Instead of being satisfied with what God had provided them with them at that time, they challenged God. The temptation was discontentment. And this understanding stares straight in the face of the whole prosperity gospel. 
Discontentment was their temptation. Learning to be content. One of the greatest memories of God of working on the mission field with the poor is to see the happy face of a child or a mother or a father that doesn't even have food to eat. And for years I used to battle with this. How is it they can be so happy? Genuine happiness. Just joyful. Just happy, content. Because they're grateful for what they've got, not for what they haven't got. Verse 19 says, They spoke against God and said, God, can God prepare a table for us in this wilderness? How quickly they forgot his benefits. How quickly we can forget what he's already done for us. Psalm 103 said, forget none of his benefits. Instead of focusing on what they did have, they focus on what they did not have. And lusting after what they didn't have. And James says in, in chapter 1 verse 15, he says, when desire or when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So once we're no longer content, we've opened the door to sin. And that desire or that lust takes a hold of us, and the outcome of that is death. Mm -hmm. Spiritual death. And that's why when people say, well, I don't hear from God, my challenge is this is the reason why. You have been drawn away with lust, with a desire, instead of being satisfied. Mm -hmm. Go back to that place, repent. Verse 20, behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? They're really provoking God now. In other words, we don't want the salvation you've offered God. We want salvation on our terms. Yeah. We are not satisfied with the salvation you offered us. Mm. Why should I be in prison? The people outside are doing what I've done and I've been caught. We need to be content in whatever place God has allowed us to be. That's a hard pill for each of us to swallow. Because life is unfair and life deals some very, very unfair blows to both children and adults. But the key to go through that wilderness season is not to focus on the unfairness of it but to focus on the goodness of God in it. Because you're going to come out the other side, and you're going to come out stronger, and God has got a purpose that you will never imagine at the other end for you. You will never know until you reach there how good God is and what he's got for the future. And when they said, we don't like your salvation on the terms you're offering it, the Bible says the Lord heard this and he was furious. God was furious. James said in the second half of, of, of verse 15 of chapter 1, And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so they died and they did not enter into what God had for them. Did they go to heaven? I, I, I'm not God. I would guess they would have. That's his business. That's not our business to get into that debate. But salvation starts on this earth. Our salvation is here now. Our freedom is here now. Yeah. Our provision, our everything God has for us, our promised land mm. is here now as much as it is there mm. one day when we go and be with him. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But very few of us ever reach the promised land on earth. And I believe this is the key. Because of a lack of contentment. We need to challenge ourselves every day. Am I being drawn away by my own desires? Am I content where God has me right this day? 
It's not an easy journey, but it's called faith. Faith. Mm. And God's leading us in a direction. We're not comfortable with. Be careful. Don't murmur against him. Don't murmur against him. Don't murmur against the circumstances. I say that because I love you. Because the Bible says that we will be drawn away with our own desire into sin. Has God given them salvation? Yes. Has he given us the same? Yes. So entering into what God's promised us here on earth is only achieved by knowing him. And we cannot know him without a fear of him. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Mm. Amen. Most believers have a fear of this mighty God capable of sending us to hell. And that means you've got faith if you believe that. But the same faith we need to apply to our daily lives. It's not just about eternity because everyone's going to live for eternity. Everyone. The greatest key to living by faith is having a fear of the Lord, I believe. Martin Luther now his thesis on the door of that Roman Catholic Church. Most of the non-believers at that time would have seen him as a heretic. I mean, here's one man in a nation that is not going the same flow in the stream as them. He would have seen, it seemed like, hey, this is a guy, I don't know if we should get involved with him because he's a heretic. He's going against what we've been taught. But he was right. And every reformation has been the same. There's a price to pay. And the price always is having a fear of God rather than a fear of man. In order to trust God, we must see our circumstances through his eyes. His eyes. His eyes are eyes of faith. And the only way we can have faith is by knowing him. I know this is simplistic, and I know that, that, that in many aspects we've been in this a long time, this journey of faith. But I believe sometimes we complicate the truth so much. We need to come back to the basics. This week I had a message from the Philippines telling me that there's five new children that have been administered, uh, brought into the children's home. And uh, these children have grown up in the rubbish dump. Literally, they live in the rubbish dump. That's all they know. They don't have a house. So at night, they just pull rubbish, garbage over themselves. And uh, Dad passed away just recently, and there's ten children. So... The message was there's five new children and they were just seeking a little bit of advice on a couple of the older children. And what touched my heart was this. They didn't have to ask my permission. They didn't have to say, is it okay with you that we've done this? Because they know me. They know what pleases me. They know what touches my heart. They know my purpose. So it is with us, with God. Mm. Most of the time we don't even need to ask him. Because he's already given us everything. If we know him, most of the time we don't even need to go to him to ask for anything. Yeah. Other than to praise and worship him. Yeah. When we know what pleases him, we come into a place of maturity. In John chapter 17 and verse 3, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they may know me. This word eternal, by the way, it's very interesting. I had a look at this yesterday. It's in the Greek. It's the word aeonis. And, and that word eternal, it means more than a, it's, it's not talking about only a duration of time, but the quality of life that God lives. This is eternal life. In other words, this is the quality of life that God lives lives and its reference in the Greek is, is, is primarily to the now not for when you get to heaven so this is how God lives now this is how God would like you to live now would like me to live now 
entering into the promised land and living the life that God has given us. This is eternal life that they, us, may know me. This word know has elements of intellectual knowledge, so part of it's to do with our ability to, to, to rationale and understand. But it's far more than that. Its primary use here is the same word that was used when Adam knew Eve. It's, 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 it's about an intimacy that they may be intimate with me. That they may know me. They may be intimate with me. And intimacy only is found in this confides of a deep loving relationship. Isaiah, in, in chapter 4, I think it is verse 6, he says, um, my people perish through a, a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, in other words, my people are not intimate with me. That's what he's saying. The Jews knew God better than most of us know our Bible. Let's be honest. So it wasn't talking about an intellectual knowing only. It was talking about an intimacy, living out this life. And You know, I was thinking about electricity, how it can be a great benefit to us. But and it enhances the quality of life. But if we don't know, electricity can also harm us. Mm -hmm. We've got a problem coming. <laughs> and it's the same with God. Mm -hmm. If we don't know the same, God is holy. He's righteous. There is no sin in him. There is no fear in him. Understanding God is like understanding electricity. There is two sides to this coin. It can benefit you, but it can also harm you. Faith is going to the Word. And I know this is simple, and it's finding those things that please Him and doing them. That's what faith is. As we draw closer to what most of us believe the Lord is coming soon, that time. My heart is stirred that my priorities need to keep changing, need to keep shifting. That what was good last year is not necessarily going to be any good this year. I don't want to miss out on what God's got for me or for you. Mm. It's not just hiding ourselves away and studying God's Word. It's good to be a student of the Word but it's taking those issues that God says are important to him and doing it. Mm. And doing it. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. And then James goes on, he said, deceiving yourself. In other words, we can hear the word, but if we don't do it, we're deceiving ourselves. That has been a challenge to me over the last couple of weeks. Because even me, who, I am a student of the word of God. I can bury myself in that and forget that I need to be doing what I'm learning. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty or the word of God and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer, this one will be blessed. And Hebrews 11, 6, remember it says, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek it. And the, Isaiah the prophet in, in chapter 40, verse 27, he tells us what this reward is and he says, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. Why do you say that? Why do you say, I don't know what the Lord wants me to do? Why do you say I'm not hearing from the Lord? That's what he's saying here. Why do you say... You don't know what my will is in your life. That's what he's saying. Why do you say you don't know what pleases me? In verse 28 he says, he gives the answer, he says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint. He doesn't become weary. His understanding is unsearchable. 
This is the answer. He gives power to the weak. And those who have no might, he increases their strength. And even the youth shall faint and be weary. I find that hard to understand because I've got a young guy that's full of beans. <laughs> but he said here, even him, he's going to become weary. <coughs> but those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. There's the key. Those who wait on the Lord yeah. shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run. They shall not be weary. And they shall walk and they won't get tired. This is the reward for those who diligently seek Him. Praise God. Mm. Huh? When my battle becomes too much for me, and when I feel I can't go on any longer, when I've lost all hope, and everything seems to be failing, if I diligently seek Him, His promise is, he gives power to the weak and renews my strength. Amen. What a great passage. Huh? There are many things that please the Father, but uh, I'm not going to go on much longer, but I want to mention one of them. One that's been on my heart for the last few weeks. First John chapter 3 and verse 22 says, for whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments. Amen. And we do those things that are pleasing to Him in His sight, that we should love one another. That we should love one another. And over the recent months, my heart's been stirred over what does this love mean? What, is it, what does it mean to love one another? And what I've extracted from that for me is it means I need to reach out more to those around me. That means I need to witness more. I need to be a witness more to those in my life, to those in the supermarket around me, to those in the mall around me, to those who, who contact me by telephone. I need to be a witness. I need to live a life that is a witness. personal witnessing and effective ways of doing that. And Romans chapter 10 verse 14 says, How can they call on the Lord when they have not believed in Him? And how can they believe in Him when they have not heard? And how can they hear unless you talk to them? I've changed the wording a little bit there, but because you're a preacher. The people need us out there. Prayer is wonderful, but prayer on itself is insufficient mm -hmm. because prayer also needs legs. Mm -hmm. Thank God for our prayer group that we pray into the prison mm -hmm. and into these needs because that's necessary, but it would never be complete unless someone went, did the work. This week, it's, I am by no means an evangelist. I used to cringe when I'd stand before big crowds. But this week I've had a stirring and excitement in my heart. To bring the good news to those that haven't heard the good news. Amen. To set the captives free. Yeah. Huh? To heal yeah. the sick. Yeah. <clears throat> to fill people with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That should excite you. Yeah. Something's happened to me, it's exciting yeah. me. <laughs> Luke chapter 15, verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together all his friends and he says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep. Mm -hmm. The one that was lost. Mm -hmm. huh? And I say to you that likewise, listen to this, there will be more joy in heaven more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who don't need to repent. If you want to make God happy, <laughs> you know what to do. My <laughs> huh? goodness. This turning away from sin by our confessional action sends heaven into a joyous, a 
flaws. Seize every opportunity the Lord gives you. Mm. It doesn't have to be a long-winded. It can just be a simple, can I pray for that pain in your legs and just command the pain to go. I believe that we'll see more miracles happen outside of the church than inside the church. Mm. Seems to be where God wants to show himself. He doesn't need to show himself in the church. And this is the story, of course, of the prodigal, the backslider, the broken, the one who's lost hope. That's a big part of the church and the rest of the world. The one that's caught in spiritual famine. That's what this story is about. And our cry should be, lead me to the lost God. Lead me to the broken. Lead me to the prodigal. Mm. And how well our eyes focused on seeing what the Father sees. How well are our ears tuned in to what our Father says when our brother shared about our sister this morning being recalled many times because she has no permanent address. The very first thought that come to my mind is she has one now. Mm. Because for me personally, my door's open to her. I don't know about you, but that's how we should be thinking. Immediately, we are the solution to the problem. Let's become the solution to others' problems. Jesus was a master fisherman. It was him who said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking about that scripture because as a young boy, I spent probably as much time fishing as I did going to school. Um, that's not an exaggeration. I probably spent three to four months of the school year fishing when I meant to be at school. I love fishing. A sister here would know. Every available opportunity, I would seize it, and I'm not encouraging our children here to follow me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, would, I would travel great distances. I, I used to go up the East Cape right up the East Cape, just to catch a certain type of fish, to target a certain type of fish. I got to thinking about that, mm -hmm. and over a period of time, I'd become an expert at land-based fishing. I could target, you could tell me, I want you to catch a snapper, and I knew where to go, and I knew what bait to catch that with, and I knew how to catch it. I knew the size hook, and used the type of bait, and a novice would think, well, the fish will eat anything. No, they don't. Some fish will only eat crayfish. Mm -hmm. I used to go fishing for a certain fish just with crayfish. Other fish will only eat crabs. Some fish will eat anything. Other fish will only eat a certain type of weed. You want to catch it on a hook, you have to know how to catch that fish. Knowing where they live knowing whether they're pelagic fish, in other words, they swim on the top or they swim on the bottom, is how you target them. Now, why I'm saying all that is because as a believer in Christ, not all fish are the same. Sure. And you need to use a different bait. Mm. And you need to know where to go to catch a certain type of fish. Because mm. if you apply one rule for all, you're going to fail. It won't work. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit when he's sitting at that well in Samaria and that woman comes along and Jesus shares her life with her. He, he has a word of knowledge. He looks into her life by the power of the Holy Spirit and he gives her a word of knowledge about her life. He doesn't say you were a bad woman or you are a bad woman because you've been sleeping with lots of guys. He just said you've had lots of husbands. Told her how many. And she said I need to go away and tell my friends. She'd become the greatest evangelist of the time. She went from being a sinner to being an evangelist mm -hmm. within five minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. huh? And here we want to throw people in Bible schools. Mm -hmm try and reshape, but this woman turns Samaria upside down. Mm. Why? Because Jesus listened 
to the father. The father told him what to say, and it was so simplistic, and it changed the whole town. Amen. <laughs> Jesus needed what bait to use. He doesn't try and convince her. You need to join our church. We got good music. No. He, he doesn't go down that path. He accommodates her and where she's at in her life. And he shows God to her in a practical way. And this is the journey I'm on at the moment. Mm -hmm. Just make your journey with God simple. Keep the prayers mm -hmm. short, especially mm -hmm. for the unbeliever. Real short. Just command the pain, the sickness to go. Mm -hmm. And let God do his thing. Sometimes we think we've got to convince the person it's not our job. It's the job of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Sometimes just a listening ear or an invitation for a meal or a coffee. That's all it takes. Maybe offering your phone number. One-on-one -on -one evangelism in this story is captured so beautifully, and yet it's so simple. This example, I believe, what each one of us can achieve. Amen. Just by listening mm. to the Holy Spirit. Just by being attentive. The Holy Spirit challenged me. It was probably two weeks ago. How do I tell others to witness if I'm not witnessing myself? Mm. I haven't arrived myself. I know none of you have. We're all on the same journey, but we can improve. We can do better. Yeah. Lord, lead me to someone today. Yeah. To someone. See, praying for revival without sharing Christ is at best a vague form of obedience to the commission, which is really disobedience, but equally bringing people into the church without the congregation making disciples is not biblical. And it's disobedience also. You can fill a church building with people and it can still be disobedience to God. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't make disciples, we have failed the commission. All we're doing is a religious service. So my heart is stirred to make disciples, and I'm trying to stir you. Start seizing the opportunities. And let's bring those testimonies together so no longer I have to stand and speak. Let the testimonies speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. That should be the church that we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. Jesus commanded, go, not stay, and expect the people to be drawn to us like a light. Uh, even me, I've had this perception over the years that God is going to shower this almighty outpouring on the church, and people are going to be drawn to it. Well, I believe... That's not the case. I believe that we need to go, and he'll go with us. Mm. It's that simple. That's going to be mm. the revival. That's going to be... The church needs reforming. There's no doubt about that. Reforming. But revival without reformation is a waste of time, because it doesn't last. Mm. I've studied this enough to know that revival without re reformation does not last. So filling the church building is not what's needed, but emptying the church buildings is what's needed. Because that's the evidence of a reformation. When people are going and doing, that's the evidence. Mm -hmm. huh? Amen. I don't see a building with 2,000 people as successful. I see a building that sends people out full of testimonies and changing lives as successful. By and large, the revivals of the 20th century have only had short-term effect on society. They never, I was sharing with my brother this week, they never changed the top gatekeepers in society, the top 3%. Mm -hmm. They never reached them. Yeah, those people came into the church. Those people did church on Sunday. But then on Monday, they go back to the system they live under. If all we do is bring these people into the church and they continue leading society with humanistic worldviews, we haven't succeeded, we've failed. To 
just because society allows man to break God's laws, God's laws do not allow man to break them. Mm. This is a very big difference. This is the reformation that needs to happen in the church. That the church is reformed and the governments are reformed. And the systems, the prison systems are reformed. And I believe God is going to do that from the inside out because he no longer can trust those on the out. Mm. He's got to use those that are in to reform the system. Yes. Mm. Reforming society has got to be our goal. One person at a time. One person at a time. This touched me on closing. If anyone has material possession and sees his brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? I pray that touch your heart too, because that's what it's all about. Mm. If anyone sees his brother or sister in need and has no pity on that need, in other words, you don't become the solution. How can the love of God be in you? Mm. James says, what good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save them? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is it? Mm. So faith, by itself, without works, is dead. It's dead. That's scary. I got a revelation of that only last night, that scripture. Mm. I've read it hundreds, if not thousands of times. Faith, by itself, that does not have works, is dead. That means my spiritual life, is died. I've died in the wilderness. And I can be going through the motions of going to church and doing everything else, reading my Bible, reading books. But I've died. That's scary. Mm -hmm. How can I say I'm a believer yet my actions don't show it? Mm. I won't go on. I've got more of it. Maybe next week I'll continue this because this is a journey not of works to get us to heaven, but this is a journey of being a doer. Because there's a world out there hurting. We've got churches full of people hurting that the needs are not being met. And time's running out. Father, we thank you for your word that does not lie, never changes. It's only us who change, Lord, because we walk away from the truth. Forgive us, Lord, I ask on behalf of all of us this day, for those areas that we have not been faithful in, for those areas that we failed you in, for not being a doer, for being criti critical, for, for murmuring against your goodness. <coughs> when we don't feel it's good enough. Mm -hmm. For not realizing that you've got us on a journey to make us strong mm -hmm. for something great that lays ahead. Lord, I pray a special blessing upon each one of our people here this day. Mm -hmm. Let us keep our eyes fixed on the goal, mm -hmm. not on the problems that are facing us at this stage. Let us keep our eyes fixed on you, the author, the finisher of our faith, mm -hmm. knowing that there is a prize for us. A prize that we don't deserve, but a prize you've freely given us. Mm -hmm. We thank you, we love you, we praise you this day, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name.